To further unite the Muslim peoples, Muhammad ended his mourning for Khadija and began to take new wives. In all, he would marry 11 women from many different tribes and clans. He lived in quarters attached to the mosque, usually spending each night in the room of another of his wives. Muhammad's wives were a diverse group. One was a Jew, another a Bedouin. One was even his cousin. Most were chosen for various political reasons, but a few, such as his third wife, Aisha, were clearly matters of the heart. Muhammad now told his followers that revelations from God said each man was permitted to take no more than four wives. Non-Muslims often ask about the, the marriage of Aisha anha, to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, at the age of nine. At the age of nine. Uh, can you give some light to this? I find it uh, amusing that uh, people who wish to defend uh, uh, women's rights make this such a big issue when Aisha herself didn't make it a big issue. She didn't seem to mind. In fact, she was very proud of it till the day she died, that the Prophet was uh, her husband. He was a very loving husband. They had a, a, the perfect marriage, uh, and there really were no issues at all. Uh, the Islamic Sharia, which is the same as uh, in this case uh, with, the, with the Jewish uh, laws as well, basically defines adulthood with the onset of puberty. Uh, and so therefore, a nine-year-old girl of Arabia 14 centuries ago would be something similar to a 16, 17-year-old of our times. And there, Aisha didn't have a problem with what happened. I, I think it's problematic when we have a problem. He left his wife behind in Leiden. She's either going to join him or he's going to eventually leave Munster and go back to her. So he's a married guy. Problem is, is when he comes to Munster, he's not there very long before he marries Bernard Nipperdolling's daughter making him a bigamist. Now, he kind of throws her to the side. He doesn't divorce her. That's not really an option. But he just kind of ignores her. And then, according to Herman von Kersenbrock, he's caught in the bed with one of the household maids in Bernard Nipperdalling's house. Again, not exactly the sort of behavior that makes a man of God look very prophet-like in the eyes of an Anabaptist, unless, of course, you can then turn around and say that God wanted me to be in bed with the maid. You know, we used the analogy earlier of him passing by a donut shop and not having any money to pay for the donut and then saying, well, God wants me to have a free donut. You know, the primary sources make it sound like Jan van Leiden's basically saying here, God wants me to have a lot of women. And it's not adultery and fornication. It's, um, it's Old Testament stuff. It's, um, you know, David, Solomon. Solomon had 700 wives. I mean, why can't I? And in 1534, the Council of Elders led by Jan van Leiden has the people assemble and announces what God wants from them now. But here you are at this announcement where the prophet from God is telling you what God wants, and the prophet tells you God wants polygamy. And it's not an option. It's a commandment. Women who were already married, but married to someone who wasn't an Anabaptist, had their marriages annulled by the leadership. Women whose husbands had fled or left or were supposed to come back but hadn't come back for a while, their marriages were annulled and were told that they were forced to marry somebody else and be unfaithful to their husbands. That's very tough. Even tougher is to be a parent with your door left ajar. Remember, the rule is you can't close your door anymore and have the authorities from the city periodically walk into your house, make your family line up, and then all of a sudden decide your 11 or 12 year old daughter is old enough to get married, pull her out of the house and marry her to someone across town who's old enough to be your grandfather. Joseph knew the practice of plural marriage would stir up public ire. After receiving the commandment, he taught a few associates about it, but he did not spread this teaching widely in the 1830s. When God commands a difficult task, he sometimes sends additional messengers to encourage his people to obey. Consistent with this pattern, Joseph told associates that an angel appeared to him three times between 1834 and 1842 and commanded him to proceed with plural marriage when he hesitated to move forward. During the third and final appearance, the angel came with a drawn sword threatening Joseph with destruction unless he went forward and obeyed the commandment fully. Joseph Smith was sealed to, I believe, 34 women. Okay. Compton's 33, plus one more that Michael Marquardt found. Um, how many complaints do we have from those wives? Zero. Okay. The people who are participating in Joseph Smith's polygamy are not complaining about it, even years later. We don't know exactly when Emma found out about Joseph Smith's practice of polygamy, but it was sometime before May 1843. At that time, she accepted Joseph's practice of polygamy 
for a short time, perhaps a few weeks, as she participated in four plural marriages. Thereafter, Emma struggled as she tried to live the principle and share her husband with, her plural, with the plural wives. Interestingly, as much as she hated polygamy, she seemed to maintain a testimony in Joseph as a prophet and as the translator of the Book of Mormon. It is true that Joseph Smith practiced plural marriage and that he had wives who were not married to anybody else. And it's true that he practiced polyandry and that he did have wives who were married to someone else. 14 years old, 16 years old. Um, he had a wife who was 14 years old, but remember, okay, on the frontier in America, women married young, often as young as 12 years of age, because the, the, the lifespan of people in those days was well, what it is huh? today. Noyes was spending ample amounts of time studying passages of the Bible in an effort to determine what sex was like in heaven. He decided that in heaven, people found spiritual soulmates, and angels enjoyed sex freely. And he realized he wanted to model his new kingdom of God on earth, just like the one in heaven. He wrote to Abigail, claiming he didn't want to interfere with her marriage. But he thought it was important for her to know that in his vision, quote, by the word of the Lord, you were given to me, end quote. In other words, without Abigail's consent, he tried to claim her as his spiritual wife. He insisted that sex was not a sin, but rather a way to become more connected to God. And he codified this concept by inventing complex marriage. In complex marriage, every man was married to every woman, and every woman to every man. Noyes exploited his position as the Oneida community's leader and created a system that forced girls as young as 11 to have sex with him. Noyes claimed that by having sex with the children and teens, he and the other elders could bring them closer to God. Jim said that all of us were homosexuals. Everyone except, he was the only heterosexual on the planet and that um, the women were all lesbians and the guys were all gay, and so anyone that showed any interest in sex was just compensating. What he explained to each of us, and in sermons, was that sexual relationships were very selfish, and they took away from the focus of the church, and that was to help others. Jim was not celibate. Nobody knew that until perhaps it was their time to find out what he spoke from the pulpit wasn't what he, he did behind the scenes. I traveled on bus seven, which was Jim's bus. And he sat down next to me. And I was sitting there and I thought, that's weird. He kind of, it, it smells like alcohol next to me. And he leaned over and he said, do you know what you do to me? He had informed me that I was to come in. And, and on bus seven, there was a room in the back, which was like a, for just him. He had books, he had a desk, he had a bed. When everyone got off the bus at the rest stop, I went into his little room and I sat there and waited for him. And finally, he opened the door and Without any talk or anything, he just pulled down his pants and, um, and had sex with me. And as I lay there, frightened, um, not sure what to do, and as I shivered, he'd say to me, this is for you. I'm doing this for you, Debbie. In 1985, David Koresh had a revelation that would shock his congregation and put their faith to the test. He told them that the men in his flock, including married men, had to become celibate to commit themselves fully to the message. Only he could have sex with the women of the community, who would become his wives and bear his children. I interviewed his wives in, uh, in California and in Hawaii and uh, the families of the wives in Australia and New Zealand, and everywhere I could find, 
He had one purpose, and that was to live his book of Revelation and make 24 babies. And that was his whole purpose. Sex was for no other purpose for him. And there was no menage or nothing. He didn't just take them because he wanted them. But these kids didn't come about just because he was a con or had a smooth talker. It was because the word and what he preached. Who is worthy to open this book and to loose the seals thereof? David's exclusive harem was difficult for many at Mount Carmel to accept, but it was especially painful for his wife, Rachel, who was pregnant with their second child. They had married when David was 24 and she was 14. She's a young girl, married, and she had a battle with it spiritually, but she, she was in her room praying about it, and, uh, but she accepted it. People say you've been sleeping with the women here. Is that true? No, only one, and she's tired of it. Now, I mean, she's tired of the accusations. Publicly, Koresh denied he had multiple wives. Privately, he admitted he was struggling with this particular word from God. He knew it would cause upheaval, desertion, and outrage. David said it all along, he says, the first one that has to accept a message from God is the messenger. He has to make up his mind, this is God, not the devil talking to me. This voice I've been following for all these years, I, I believe was God. And you finally have to come to the conclusion, it's the same voice. Even though it's telling me to do something that's contrary to the law, it's contrary to public opinion, it's contrary to my own feelings, uh, what the heck's my wife gonna say when she finds out, all this kind of stuff, uh, he has to deal with it and make up his mind to do it. And that's what God honored him for. When God spoke, he, he obeyed. All I can say is that David did what God told him to do, his belief of what God told him to do, and I accept that. If they're old enough to work, they're old enough to be adults, in every sense. Now, here's a problem. You've got children at, at uh, you call them children, 12-year-olds, uh, 13-year-olds, a girl. She's capable of being a mum. Is she a child? To yes. Us, she, yes, she's called a child, but really she's a woman now. She's capable of being a mother. You've got a boy capable of being a father at 14. Are you saying a 12-year-old girl is considered a woman? In the sense of physical development, she's a woman. Nice. You're right! Watch out. Sign on at Gloria Vale, <laughs> and you commit to the curious lifestyle of hopeful Christian, who married his third wife, Ruth, in his late 60s. She was just 17. They have four children under 14, and another on the way. So what's this area for? This is our living quarters here. This is, where, this is our whole big family here, isn't it, kids? You know, our brothers and sisters and cousins. Yeah, this is where we are. It's a is remarkable insight into their lives. This 20 square metre space, home for six. Yeah. So where does everybody sleep? Ah, uh, all right. Where's the big boy? Faithful sleeps up there. He's king of the roost. It was living quarters like these that former community members complained about, saying children were exposed to sex. I have to put the question. No, uh, Janet, that, it's, uh, 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 we're not going into that. That's right. With, with all, these, all these things, when our people are not into it. We're not into it. Uh, the, the, the sexual assault? No, we're not, we're not into it. They want to believe what they want to believe. They want to say what they want to say. They can turn anything good into evil. Anything they can, they can turn that into evil. You don't deny it? I've told you before, people will believe what they want to believe. And then God said to me, you are Messiah. Certainly by no instruction from me, two witnesses, these two, uh, left their homes, left their families, and, and it wasn't at my instruction or behest. It just occurred. But these women aren't just devoted witnesses. Michael insists God commanded him to start having sex with both of them. He convinced their husbands, who were still in the cult, he was just following God's orders and told them to direct their distress heavenward. There was a battle between me and God. And I was like, Michael was on my side. He said, if you're angry at God, 
Go tell him. Michael was my way through it. So I said, well, Michael, I said, I've been having this thought that I just needed to come up here and take off all my clothes. Really. And he looks at me and he kind of smiles. So I said, well, I said, shall I? And he, he thought for just a minute. He was quiet. And, you know, I know he was listening for Father's instructions. And he said, you may. So he, ha he took me, to, went to the bedroom and uh, laid down. And he uh, held me. And somehow... It was like all of heaven was open to me. Somehow I started to see God. Well, somehow. As the Son of God holding me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I'm laying there and I was like, for the first time I was like, God loves me. Mm -hmm. He loves me. My experience was, you know, similar to yours. Uh huh. I took off my clothes and I laid naked on his bed and he just held me. And it was like a whole new picture opened up to me of God. God came down on Michael and forced him to consummate with Christiana. I mean, it was a terrible, strange act of God. He did a, an astonishing thing that uh, I was astonished, and so was Michael. Michael had made no mention of sleeping with his son's wife. And I got the feeling this was a story I wasn't supposed to hear. And when Michael found out I knew, he asked me for an opportunity to explain just how God had made it happen. Um, I stood up like this, and, um, and suddenly I was forced down on the floor, and I had to get down, I was down just about like this, and I was in pain and all I could do was groan. All I could do was kind of rock. And I, I started seeing that the consummation with Christiana was imminent and I was going to be, um, I was going to have to do that. I was just laying awake and I was thinking about um, coming over here. And I said to Father, I said, when I go over there, if Michael invites me in, I will ask for the consummation tonight. Flora Edwards was born into the children of God after her parents, looking for purpose in their lives, joined the sect. Founded in 1968 in California by David Brant Berg, who followers called Father David, the children of God believed the apocalypse was at hand. Father David pushed sexual freedom, and he even advocated underage sex. God created boys and girls able to have children by about the age of 12. Oh my God, now he's going to advocate childhood sex. Yes. In 1976, David Berg introduced flirty fishing, which encouraged female members to show God's love through sexual relationships with potential converts. As for young girls like Christina, she says they were encouraged to engage in what Berg called sexual sharing. Father David had sent out a letter to everybody and uh, said that children should be shown how to have sex. And an adult couple came and got me in the night and showed me how to have sex. The Lord showed me he's very pleased with this group of 12 ladies willing to do whatever you're called on to do and others that have stepped forward and are learning how to live the higher order of the celestial law. I love you more than you know and I'm so grateful for all of you. You have to be converted to think of God and your husband, that's me, in every thought, desire, work, action. And I'm here to do the will of my Father and this Heavenly Father.